Uh, my name is Martin Hunigel. I'm from the Medical University of Graz, um, and I'm part of the Infectious Disease Division here. Um, led by Robert Krause is in the room as well. And um, also, together with Jürgen Prates, we are um, having a focus on clinical mycology and translational mycology. And it's today really our special pleasure to welcome um, Gustavo Goldman from the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil, who is re really, I think, a worldwide leader in Aspergillus biology. And um, we are super happy that he's with us. He spent the day with us and he's also giving a very exciting talk um, about the interactions between Pseudomonas and Aspergillus in specifically. And I think with that, we already lost some time. We don't want to let you wait uh, much more. Gustavo, please take it away. Is everybody checks online seeing the full screen mode? You can see moving the slides. Yes, perfect. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, thank you very much to Martin and all the colleagues here for the invitation, the kind introduction of Martin. And uh, today, what I'm going to do, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, quite a new project we have in the lab in the last uh, two, three years. We are trying to understand the interaction between Pseudomonas aeruginosa and Aspergillus fumigatus. And then uh, I think most of you, uh, here's not moving. Let's see here. No, it's not moving. The slide's not moving here. Why? And it's no. Yeah, now it's moving. Thanks. Uh, let's let's start uh, giving you some uh, background about uh, uh, generally about uh, fungal and bacterial interactions. You know, there is a kind of equation. You no, know? uh, physical associations can be planktonic or mixed biofilm, or sometimes intra hyphal colonization. And then, uh, depending on the kind of physical association, we have several kinds of molecular communications. We can have antibiosis, signaling plus chemotaxis. We can have physical, physical chemical uh, changes, uh, protein secretion, metabolite exchange, that's very common in, in microbiomes, metabolite conversions, that's very common in, in microbiomes, adhesion, the, the communication can happen through adhesion, or then a horizontal transfer of genes through genetic exchange. And then, of course, this uh, causes a lot of alterations to the part and can change the community structure, can in, impact the niche construction, can help the movement, transport some uh, bacteria can be transported through uh, fungi, mycelia by the, 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 the what is, is called, uh, you know, high highway. And then we can have gene acquisition. There are a lot of gene acquisitions, you know, and then nutrition, pathogenicity, many things related to development and morphology, the reproduction sometimes, growth, stress resistance, survival, symbiosis. There are a lot of interactions that can happen uh, from both partners. You, you probably are very familiar with uh, Pseudomonas as a very nasty pathogen, pathogen can cause a lot of uh, problems in terms of, uh, uh, you know, disease like pneumonia, enteritis, meningitis, sepsemia. And uh, uh, Pseudomonas is able to uh, establish several interactions, not only with bacteria, but also with virus and, and fungi. It's very well studied, the interactions between uh, Pseudomonas and bacteria, and there are a lot of information about Candida albicans and uh, Pseudomonas. But uh, fumigates, although there are some information about it, uh, we believe, and that's the main reason why we start working in this area, we believe that there is no solid genetic uh, information about that. I mean, I'm talking about the, the genes that are important to establish the interaction. And we know from the literature that colonization of fumigators is normally associated with an increased risk of Pseudomonas aeruginosa colonization in cystic fibrosis patients, a very important chronic disease. And uh, we also know that disease prognosis is poor when both pathogens are present. But uh, actually, 
uh, there are very controversial reports about the interaction between pseudomonas and fumigators. You know? Sometimes uh, some people, they talk about, uh, you know, uh, opponents, you know, some things they talk about, they are collaborating, and probably all these interactions are happening at the same time, depending on the immunological status of the patient, depending on the age of the patient, depending on the strains, and many things like that are happening in different patients or happening at the same time in the same patient. Uh, let me introduce you to fumigators. I don't know if you're familiar with fumigators. Fumigators uh, can cause a lot of clinical entities that are normally grouped under the name of Aspergy laws. And these uh, uh, clinical entities, the worst of them is the invasive pulmonary Aspergy laws. And as you can see in this, uh, in this graph here, you see that uh, the different entities, uh, they are dependent on the immunological status of the patient, you know. There are several entities that can cause uh, allergy, or then they can grow in patients with the normal immunological system. But uh, as I told you, the worst of them, the worst entity is the invasive pulmonary specialist that is mostly dependent on immunosuppressed patients. We are talking a bad, about a bad health problem. Uh, probably there are estimated, the estimated number of 3 million cases of asbestos loss a year, and uh, probably more than 300 cases of IPE each year. And uh, I, I don't know if uh, the infectious disease people here agree, but probably this is one of the most little infectious disease. We are talking about uh, 40 to 90 percent of uh, lethality, you know. Uh, I think it probably, if it's not the most little, it's probably one of the most little disease. And uh, um, why, why fumigators? No, the, the, the phylogenetic tree of Aspergilli is really plenty of species, about 300 species, 250 species. And why a fumigator is the most little? You have like a fisher eye that is very closely related, uh, Orbeliniensis, all these species, they are probably 95% identical at, 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 at DNA level. But why fumigators is so special, you know? We have Fisher, you have like four cases, you know? And here, uh, although the school is really big, you know, it was some problem in the presentation, but we have three, 300,000 cases, as I told you, you know? And then, what makes Aspergillus so special, you know? We believe that Aspergillus, among many other genetic determinants, is special because Aspergillus can produce a large number of secondary metabolites. And we, when we talk about uh, a large number, we are talking about uh, almost 600 genes that contribute to about 33 biosynthetic gene clusters in fumigators. And normally, I want to tell you a little bit about the organization of the biosynthetic gene clusters. Normally, uh, there are several genes present in these uh, biosynthetic gene clusters, but uh, normally, uh, they are common genes to all canonical BCGs are like uh, synthase or synthetase that are important. They work in different percursors depending on the class of synthetase or synthase, and they can synthesize the first step in the biosynthesis. And then there are several uh, decorating enzymes, Taylor enzymes, that can modify uh, chemically many of these, uh, of these precursors. And then uh, non-canonical elements are like uh, transcription factors. We are going to talk about that uh, along the presentation. Or uh, normally most of these uh, secondary metabolites are toxic to the own organism that produce it, and then it has to protect by uh, many mechanisms of self-protection. That's a, a quite interesting research line that we are working. In my lab, I'm going to show to you some results about that. But sometimes they are present, sometimes they are not present in, in the cluster, like the transcription factors. Or there are many hypothetical or enigmatic genes that we have no clue what they are doing there. Okay, uh, what secondary metabolites are doing? You know, secondary metabolites are essential for fungal survival. Uh, you know that everybody working with microbiology knows that uh, uh, Fleming gave a, a fundamental contribution with the discovery of penicillin. But that's that's amazing. When he uh, received the Nobel Prize, his speech during the Nobel Prize, he already was thinking about one health. You know, he, he, he said you know, that uh, ordinary man probably is going to create a lot of trouble buying and using antibiotics. It was already in 45 talking about that. You know? But what, what is the function? What is secondary metabolites they do? Normally, 
they can work as signaling molecules that mediate the communication uh, with its surroundings. They can be virulence factors. I'm going to talk about uh, one of these virulence factors and fumigators, that's the gliotoxin. They can microbial can be microbial inhibitors that shape the competition with other microorganisms uh, like uh, siderophores, you know, they are secondary metabolites, or defense against fungivores. You know, the, the fungus produce a lot of uh, secondary metabolites that accumulate normally in the mycelium or in the, or in the conidia, and when the, the, the insects or some other fungivores, they come to it, they have uh, some toxicity to the, to the organism. You know? um, Okay, let's, let's talk a little bit about the nature of the interaction. When we, we, we have a, a, a Pseudomonas aeruginosa constitutively fluorescent GFP strain, normally what you see that is it's a kind of interaction that the, 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 the bacteria sticks is growing on the surface of the fungus, okay? And, uh, and then uh, we, in my lab, we have been trying to understand exactly how is this interaction, but at the biofilm lab, we create biofilm, I'm going to show to you, and then we have biofilms formed by the interaction between pseudomonas and, and, and fumigators. If you look to this nice uh, picture from the phototech, from the Institut Pasteur, you see clearly that uh, this is, they, they have painted uh, artificially, but you see clearly that you have all the biofilm, that's probably mostly of it is galactomanan, uh, some uh, you know, other carbohydrates and uh, DNAs and many things that are produced by the fungus and the uh, pseudomonas sticks to the, to the hive. Here you see uh, pseudomonas, you have this nice flagella and they are growing here. And uh, actually now in my lab we are trying to characterize the secretion systems. Which secretion? There are several secretion systems, about six different secretion systems. And uh, probably if they stick, to the germline, to the hyphae, probably they are secreting something inside. That's the, our, our belief. Okay. Um, what uh, Pseudomonas is doing? Pseudomonas is producing a lot of uh, uh, different uh, uh, metabolites. And most of these metabolites, uh, they are, it's producing also coron sensing molecules that control the production of many of the secondary th these, uh, metabolites. You have here uh, some uh, uh, products that are important for uh, chelating iron, uh, some products that are important like phenazine to create uh, uh, production of ROS uh, uh, or reactive nitrogen species that can cause trouble to the fungus. Also, they can produce uh, genorum lipids that can inhibit the bet one triglucan synthase and can make a thick cell wall, high chitin, and some people sometimes they believe, oh, that's good for the fungus because it can make the fungus more resistant to caspofungin. Oh, that's good for the bacteria because maybe it's helping to protect from the, 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 the host and so on, so on, so That's very controversial and uh, we don't have really a lot of information about that. But uh, 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 what happened? Normally, uh, that, uh, that's a schematic, it was cut, the thing here. But anyway, uh, we, uh, we, we are interested in my lab in this specific class that is the phenazine, you know, that are important for iron chelation, fungal killing, and then the host immune cells creates also host production and cell apoptose. Actually, uh, that's one of the things that we are doing in my lab. We are, we, we are interpreting the way Pseudomonas interacts with the host immune cells maybe is the same way or part of the program is conserved to interact with the fungus. For example, uh, uh, LPS, you know, uh, normally the bacteria produce a lot of LPS and this can control inflammation in the host cell. We are checking now if the LPS can kill the fungus because nobody checked that, you know. It's a so simple experiment, but nobody did it, you know. And then we, we don't know yet, but uh, I think that's going to happen. Maybe the LPS is going to cause troubles to the fungus too. But uh, uh, in the whole cell, phenazines, they can create a lot of trouble, you know, they can, uh, in, you know, iron acquisition, they can kill the whole cells, they can create a lot of trouble. And uh, when we look 
to the biosynthesis of these phenazines in Pseudomonas, it's, uh, it's, uh, there are two operons involved in the, in the biosynthesis, you know? And then there is a precursor that's a chorismic acid and goes to phenazina, PCA, and then there are several genes that can transform. All these phenazines are important, and this is one of the hallmarks of Pseudomonas, that is the color. You can have a kind of bluish green color, and it's called biopiocinin. And uh, as I told you, there are two clusters involved in the biosynthesis, and these two clusters, they cross talk, you know. Uh, the model is that these two clusters, they are activated differentially during planktonic culture, that's aerobically, or when uh, the bacteria produce biofilms in hypoxia or microaerobic environments, you know. And these two operons, they are regulated by different coral sensing systems. And then uh, we decided to investigate that uh, in the fungus. That was one of the first things that we investigated uh, 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 in terms of the, of the crosstalk between the fungus and the bacteria. And uh, this was really very complicated because we had to establish the biofilm interaction took us some time to find the right concentrations, the right uh, uh, number of cells for the bacteria, the right number of conidia for the fungus, the time. But then after a certain time, now the conditions are very well established. And what you see here is a, a qPCR. Normally, uh, we take advantage of a very specific sigma factor, that is the ACFX, to amplify the bacteria. And then we just use the 18S uh, uh, ribosomal DNA to amplify the fungus. Then we can have a quantitative assay. We can work with, uh, you know, just uh, checking uh, the growth by, by biofilm formation, just by using, uh, you know, XTT or something like that. But also we can measure really precisely how many uh, uh, bacteria are there and how many uh, uh, nuclei from the fungus are present. And then, in the beginning, we tried two conditions, normoxin and hypoxia. And what you see here is the, the, the controls, uh, biofilm of uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and the control of fumigators. And then, of course, when we measure the ECFX, there is no fumigators here. And then we have mutants, and I have the wild type and two different mutants. The, this is the mutant for one of the operons I showed to you, and that's the mutant for the other operon. And uh, as you can see here, uh, this is the, the establishment of the technique. It's working very well. Pseudomonas is great. We don't see really very much difference between the one of the operons, the other operon. And then when we measure uh, uh, aspergillus, you see that uh, also during normoxia, uh, we don't see really a big difference in terms of concentration uh, comparing with the white type uh, pseudomonas and the mutants. And the hypoxia, we see a little bit, but the two mutants are about the same, indicating that uh, the two operons for phenazine, they are very redundant. They are working redundantly uh, in the presence of fumigates. It means that this model that I showed to you is probably working when pseudomonas is alone or in vitro conditions. But when pseudomonas interact with fumigates, we don't see really uh, one uh, operon prevailing on another operon. Both operons are redundant. And the same thing happens when we look for the secondary metabolite production. We look at for, uh, 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 here you see the mutants alone, the white type, and we measure all the uh, metabolites present from pseudomonas and all the metabolites present from fumigators. And that here starts the trouble because it's a very redundant system. Uh, we could be really nice to take all these secondary metabolites one by one and just, uh, you know, if I delete the synthetase from, you know, uh, uh, for example, uh, uh, gliotoxin uh, is going to impair completely. It's not like that. It's much more complicated than that. But you see that during normoxin and hypoxia is very consistent, you know. You see that the, sec the metabolites from uh, uh, pseudomonas, they are produced, and many metabolites constantly produced, no, no big difference between them, okay? Then uh, we decided to validate that by taking some of the synthetase genes and deleting them. 
And as I told you, you see that, uh, you know, we make Nazolene, uh, many others, they are not very much different. They are not impacting. We delete the genes, you see that there is not a big impact on pseudomon. So pseudomon is not growing more or less, you know, except for gliotoxin. There is a, a minor contribution of gliotoxin here, but it's being reported in the literature. And just to show to you how, how, how crazy science is, people in the literature, they do experience with gliotoxin, just adding supernatants. No, nobody has deleted the gene of the synthetase of the gliotoxin cluster and try to do experiment like that. They are just doing, you know, a lot of uh, experiments using extracts of pseudomonas and show oh, gliotoxin is important. Or they using pure gliotoxin. That's the first time that uh, people are using a mutant to, to, to check if gliotoxin is important. You see some reduction, but it's not dramatically important, you know. Okay, then we talked. We have to go backwards and try to do some genetics, you know, because uh, without genetics, we are not going to learn anything about that, you know. And then uh, we decide to ask which, which Aspergillus fumigatus re is recognizing, because the, the, the bacteria is on the top. It's growing on the hyphae. Then probably there are elements, receptors, or some elements on the surface of the fungus that can recognize the bacteria and then can activate all the signal transduction pathways to cope with the bacteria or to kill the bacteria or something happened here. But I can, I can, I can, I can. I close the presentation. Where is the presentation? Here. Don't worry. And then. Uh, then the first thing that we did, uh, we decided uh, to raise the hypothesis that maybe uh, receptors on the surface are important for the recognition. Then we started with a, a, a group of receptors, the G-protein couple receptors. Uh, we, we have uh, classical receptors in fumigates. There are about 16 of them. You are probably familiar with these receptors. They have these uh, uh, seven transmembrane segments, and then uh, they have uh, endogenous uh, uh, domains that uh, intra intracellular domains that can recognize G alpha proteins. G alpha proteins they are associated with G beta, G gamma proteins, and then normally when uh, some receptors activate the G alpha, they have some cell phosphorylation and they separate from G gum and beta, and G alpha is going to activate some targets, and G gum and beta are going to activate other targets, other, other targets, and normally this is related, these targets are related to cyclin P signaling, MAP kinase, and protein kinase A pathway. And uh, Spejus fumigatus has three G alpha proteins, and one G beta, and one G gamma, okay? And we decided to screen all the G alphas, because G gamma and G beta, they are very, sick mutants, you know. We delete all these genes, we have all the deletions of these genes, and also we decided to add to this screening other receptors that we have in the lab, you know. We have um, uh, three receptors and a histidine kinase that also works as a receptor. These three receptors are MSBA, that is the homologue of MSB2, that's important for the activation of MAP kinase, OPA, that's the homologue of OP2 in Saccharomyces cerevisiae, that's also important for the activation. Show A, that's also important for the activation of MAP kinase, show 1 in Saccharomyces, and as I told you, the SLN1, that is really essential in Saccharomyces cerevisiae for the activation of the MAP kinase pathway, mainly the uh, HOG and the MPKA, the cell wall integrity pathway. And that was really interesting, you know, because we start looking at first, a lot of work, you know, decide to do biofilm formation. And then immediately, just by using biofilm formation, we saw that seven of these mutants, and here what we do is we compare always the mutant in the presence of uh, pseudomonas with the biofilm formation of the mutant alone. If the mutant alone has no problems to do biofilm formation, and we see a decrease in the biofilm formation of the mutant with the pseudomonas, then we think that we have a hint, we have a, a candidate. And then we were really lucky because we got seven candidates, and then when we validate them by using qPCR, by using the methodology that I showed to you, uh, you see that all the seven candidates, they are 
they have redux, reduced uh, amount of uh, 18S. And uh, that's really cool. You know? When we look to the pseudomonas, they take advantage of the reduced growth and they grow more. That's not always the case. We're going to see along the presentation that some mutants, they allow to do it, and some other mutants, they don't allow to do it. Sometimes the, the pseudomonas do, does not take advantage of the reduced growth. They keep the same kind of growth. We don't know why, but it, it's like that. Okay, and then which genes are modulated during this interaction? Then we decided to take one of these mutants. We are going to take off then, but we decided to start with the most central one. Huh? Remember that I told you that uh, G alphas are important for the activation of many things, you know, and we don't know which G GPCR. There are, in our screening, there are two GPCRs. We don't know which GPCR is interacting with the G alpha. We identified this G alpha, GPAB, and then we thought maybe it's, it's good to start with the G alpha. And then what we did was the RNA seq. You know, we took the interaction, and that's a, a kind of complicated RNA seq. What normally we do, we compare the wild type plus pseudomonas. Uh, we, we just compare with the biofilm formation of the wild type alone, and we go and we do the same thing with the mutant delta GPAB uh, versus pseudomonas, and we compare that with uh, the GPAB alone, and then when we, we see which genes are specifically expressed during the interaction, they are not dependent on biofilm formation, then we compare the mutant with the white type. That's exactly what you see here. You see that uh, common genes are 92, 24 hours interaction. We are taking earlier steps of the interaction. And then you have uh, in 48 hours, the interaction for us is five days biofilm formation. We are taking 24 and 48 hours. And uh, there are a quite decent amount, uh, quite decent number of genes modulated. We are talking about uh, two-fold modulation, you know, like uh, log, log two, one-fold modulation, negatively or positively, you know. And then you see thousands of genes or sometimes hundreds of genes. It's a lot. And then when we, character, we, we categorize them, the, the 24 or 48 hours, we see a lot of things, you know, a lot of things related. Many of these things are related to uh, a, a remodeling of uh, ribosomal translation or mitochondrial activity. We see a lot of uh, secondary metabolites, you know. And then we decided to look more carefully to the modulation of these genes. And uh, remember that I told you in the very beginning of my presentation that there are 33 biosynthetic gene clusters, you know, in, in fumigators. And here you see these numbers are related to the 33 biosynthetic gene clusters. And here we are comparing the mutant versus the white type, 24 hours and 48 hours. You see that many, many, many of these uh, uh, clusters, the genes of this cluster are modulated. You see a gliotoxin that has 13 genes in the cluster, only two of them are modulated, but glyotoxin is really important. But uh, uh, what drove our attention was this guy here. And this is validated by what you see here is production of secondary metabolites five days. We took the secondary metabolites, we took the supernatants of the biofilms, and then we, we, we validate all this, most of these uh, uh, secondary metabolites. That's not only gene expression. We are talking about production of secondary metabolites. And this guy, Peter Peter Pen, really immediately called our attention. All the genes in the cluster, they are reduced in the GPAB mutants, you know? I decided to look because, you know, why we decide to look to to this uh, cluster because pirupirupin, for, for people who are not familiar, this was identified as an inhibitor of the sterol O acyl transferase 2. Uh, some Japanese group, they were looking for inhibitors present in, in the production of secondary metabolites or fumigates that could inhibit this enzyme. This could be good for cholesterol reduction in human beings. But why, why a fungus is producing a piru piru pen to reduce cholesterol, you know, in the human. And then we identify 
this cluster is important for the interaction with uh, fumigates and pseudomonas. Probably is one of these humanized things that, that we, we identify one thing and we think, oh, that's the function, but maybe there is a completely different function. You know? And I, actually, we don't know the function yet, but let me show to you the whole story. You know? And then when we look to the genes, the modulation of the, as I told you, there are nine genes in the cluster. We look to the biofilm formation only in the wild type, okay? And uh, uh, you see here, we are talking here about uh, the, this uh, 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 um, black square is the white type and the gray square is the mutant. You see the biofilm formation both, the white type and the mutant. We are talking about FPKM, the number of transcripts that we see in these nine genes. It's not dramatically different, but when we look to the uh, GPAB, during the interaction of pseudomonas aeruginosa is dramatically different. In, in most of the genes, they, are, they have reduction of the expression. And they, they really do not produce piripiropen. Um, we deleted the, the synthetase, and uh, this uh, is a very interesting cluster, nine genes. There is no transcription factor in the, gene, in the biosynthetic gene cluster. And that's important because uh, the transcription factor could be the solution for the problem. Maybe there is a transcription factor that's regulating a lot of things, not only the piripiropen that could be involved in the, in the, in the interaction of pseudomonas. And then, uh, uh, as I showed to you, remember that uh, when we, um, where is it? Uh, here, when we deleted the GPAB, we see this is a hollow of inhibition. We, we have the bacteria here in the middle and all the, the rest here is fungus, you know, and then there is a, a very big hollow, almost the double, means that GPAB is really sensitive to uh, pseudomonas growth. Actually, when we do this GFP experiment that I showed you in the very beginning, we see tons of bacteria, you know, much more bacteria uh, growing on the top of the hyphae than in the wild type. It's really sensitive to the, to the bacteria, you know? And uh, when we deleted the, the, the piropin gene, we don't see the same thing. And you see here, we deleted, there is no more piropin production by mass spec, but we don't see the same thing. And the mutants, it's quite healthy. There is no problem, no problems in fitness, and, uh, but, the most spectacular thing is that when we grow the synthetase mutant that we call PIR2 in the presence of, uh, of the pseudomonas, there is a dramatic reduction. You know, it's about 50% reduction. You know? And uh, we tried to complement it by adding pure pure pen, but we, are, we are never able to see rescue of the phenotype by adding pure pure pen. But pseudomonas, does not take advantage, you know, it doesn't grow more. It's about the same growth, you know. Uh, that's a big problem now because we have no clue what peer peer pen is doing, you know. We, it would be really beautiful if peer peer pen could inhibit uh, uh, pseudomonas growth. We try to do that, but it's not working. And then uh, we, we don't know what to do, and then we decide to do what people do when they don't know what to do. Just go to bioinformatics, you know. And, and then, uh, uh, before that, uh, some people always criticize because, you know, you are working with fumigators with a strain that is uh, isolated from uh, uh, invasive pulmonary specialized case. And you are working with a pseudomonas strain that was isolated from a burning, a problem of a burning in a patient with a, a problem of burning. And uh, you are not working with, uh, you know, chronic patients, you know, strains from chronic patients. Why we do it? Because all the relevant uh, uh, genetic tools are present in these strains. We have insertion libraries for PA-20, that is uh, PA-14, that is the, the strain that we're working in, in pseudomonas. In, and we have, insert, we have deletion libraries for CA-17. Otherwise, we could not work. And then uh, we decided to check by using uh, strains from cystic fibrosis pa patients, you know, and uh, the cystic fibrosis patients, we have about uh, 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 nine strains, and all these nine strains, they also, the peer two in contact with its strains grows less, okay? And uh, again, these strains, they don't take advantage of the growth. 
you know, the reduced growth of the mutant. Seems to be consistent. Seems that uh, really PIR2 is important. Then what to do? Bioinformatics. Uh, you see here, uh, that's quite interesting. We were not prepared to that, you know. We decided to check if the PIR2 mutants were important for virulence in the, in the mammalian host, you know. We, we took advantage of a chemotherapeutic model, a neutropenic model of invasive aspergillosis. And actually, uh, when you go to the statistics, you know, this, 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 this statistics, that's a, it's always important to have statistics, you know, tell us that the, these two mutants are equal to the wild type. But uh, you don't believe on that. Huh? I don't believe on that. They are different, you know. They are attenuated. But the statistics is telling us they are, they are the same, but they are not the same. And uh, why these guys are, are attenuated, we don't know. We are, we are working on that in the lab, trying to understand, exposing them to immune cells, to see cytokine production, to do, you know, phagocytosis experiments, to see it probably they are important. The production of pyropyropene that was never reported as important for the infection, maybe is important for the infection. And finally, uh, we decided to take advantage of uh, uh, this new pipeline that was created. I think it's still in press. It was being re revised the paper. It's a nucleic acid research paper that has been published by Nancy Keller's lab. And that's really interesting, you know. What they did was they create a resource like uh, we have already for Saccharomyces cerevis, we have already for many other species, you know, where we can predict interactions based on RNA-seq. And then, for example, we dropped all the nine genes from the pyropyropin cluster here, and then we asked the, the, the data bank just to look to the RNA-seq data and to see correlations between uh, experiments where these genes were expressed and to see in these experiments how they were correlated, you know. For example, uh, there are transcription factors that are always being uh, transcribed uh, uh, in the same way than the pyropyropino genes. And that's the result, what you see, this system biology, this correlation, and the correlation is interesting because uh, brought us one, two, three, four, uh, five transcription factors and one receptor. That's a receptor of blue lights that um, I don't think it works uh, really uh, uh, in, in terms of blue light reception, you know. We don't know exactly what this receptor is doing. We are going to characterize them. But let me show some preliminary results of this transcription factors to you. Uh, one of these transcription factors, that is the NSDD, is a key repressor that affects the quantity of a sexual spores in fumigators, you know. But not only that, but it's important for the cell wall biosynthesis, you know. And now we are checking exactly uh, by using RNA-seq and other techniques what uh, NSDD is doing. But uh, uh, it would be really interesting if NSDD is controlling the production of pyropyropen. And not only that, but uh, it's controlling pyropyropen and other genes that are important for the interaction with uh, 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 pseudomonas. And also, maybe this is mediated through GPAB, through the, 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 the alpha G protein. We don't know yet. OK, I hope I convinced you that uh, uh, genetics is important to study the interactions between pseudomonas and, and uh, fumigators. But uh, now I want to show to you an even more interesting aspect of the problem, you know, because fumigators produce gliotoxin. And gliotoxin, I showed to you, is important for the interaction with uh, 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 pseudomonas. Piripiropen is also important, but piripiropen is not toxic to fumigators, you know, but gliotoxin is extremely toxic to fumigators. Gliotoxin is very fungicidal against uh, not only fumigators, but also the host, bacteria, many other organisms. No? And how fumigators is protecting itself against gliotoxin when it's producing it? No? Because it's secreting gliotoxin, but gliotoxin is coming back. And many times it's coming inside the cytoplasm again. How fumigators is protecting it against it? You know? 
that's uh, uh, probably could be interesting. It could be used as a kind of Achilles heel. If you understand, uh, biotoxin is essential for the infection of uh, mammalian cells, you know, for the infection of the host. Uh, that's one of the most studied secondary metabolites. We are talking about uh, uh, the detection in, in, in human, in, in, in mouse, uh, of glytoxin in the lungs is already performed. We can see glytoxin secreted and present in the lungs. We delete the genes of the glytoxin gene cluster. Uh, many of these genes, uh, we cannot have uh, infection. It's completely virulent in the uh, non-neutropenic patients, you know, or in non-neutropenic uh, mouse model. I, I, I mentioned to you in the very beginning uh, how the genes are organized in the cluster. Some of them are non-canonical, canonical. Uh, the protective genes are non-canonical most of the time. Many, many secondary metabolites, they have biosynthetic gene clusters with canonical genes. Glytoxin has it, you know? but uh, many, gene, many biosynthetic gene clusters, they don't have it. And uh, they can be divided in, in, in some classes. You know? uh, for example, some fungi that produce fumagilin. Fumagilin inhibits the methionine aminopeptidase. Methionine aminopeptidase is essential for uh, protein translation, no? because uh, for many proteins, the methionine has to be cleaved after the translation. And then uh, methionine aminopeptidase that's uh, actually used against cancer, many other uh, human pathologies, is also toxic to the fungus. But the fungus has five copies of the gene, you know, has three copies in the genome and two copies in the biosynthetic gene class. There's a lot of uh, methionine amino peptidase and maybe it gets really resistant to, to fumagilin. Or then uh, we can have enzymes that modify the secondary metabolites, detoxifying it, uh, like uh, in, in the glytoxin, you are going to see that we have that, and then transporters, you know, transporters that can pump the drug out of the cytoplasm. And what is really interesting is that some of the genes that, uh, uh, are, uh, that are involved in the resistance to this secondary metabolite, they are present not only in the producers, but also in the non-producers fungi. For instance, uh, Aspergillus fumigatus can use, uh, I'm going to talk about that, GLI-T, that is uh, oxyreductase to modify gliotoxin. And needles that's not a producer also has a homologue of GLI-T. What glyotoxin does? Glyotoxin, as I told you, is uh, a fungicidal, secondary metabolites, drives macrophage towards apoptose, inhibits macrophage-mediated phagocytose, uh, is important for the assembly of NADPH, and finally, recently, was shown as inhibiting the biosynthesis of leukotrien, that is a neutrophil chemoattractant. And as I told you, it's a kind of double-edged sword because not only inhibits the host, but also kills the own fungus, you know? And what are the mechanisms of cell protection, you know? Let me give you a very brief description of the cluster, you know? There are uh, 13 genes in the cluster, and uh, this cluster is unique because it has transcription factor, a transcription factor called GLI-Z. This transcription factor can uh, control all the genes that are in the cluster except GLI-T, and then it has a synthetase that's a non-ribosomal peptide synthetase that can uh, control, that, that can help to synthesize the, 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 the glyotoxin, the first step of the biosynthesis, has a transporter that's important for self-defense, can pump the drug out, and uh, has GLI-T. What is GLI-T? GLI-T is essential for the protection. If we delete GLI-T, the fungus cannot produce gliotoxin and is very sensitive to gliotoxin. Uh, GLI-T is a biofunctional enzyme. Uh, sometimes acts as uh, oxidase, sometimes acts as a reductase. And then uh, when it acts as a reductase, it converts gliotoxin to diethyl gliotoxin and uh, helps to uh, reduce the impact of the production of gliotoxin. But this form here is extremely toxic to the fungus, you know, can cause a lot of troubles in terms of oxo reduction inside the cell. And then there is another gene, GTMA, 
that is uh, biomethyltransferase that transfer methyl groups to the diethyl glytoxin. It's quite complex the way all the resource the fungus is using to protect itself against glyotoxin. I'm going to make it easier for you, but keep that in, in mind. Gly-Z does not regulate the expression of Gly-T, and Gly-T is important for the interconversion of glyotoxin between the reduced and oxidized forms, and when we started this work, the transcription facts that were regulating Gly-T and GTMA remained unknown. Let me show to you in this space how it works. No? Uh, phenylalanine, serine, and then the synthetase goes, and then you have all the decoration of the molecule, oh, lots of decoration. Most of the steps here are very well known, except for one or two. As I told you, is the most well studied secondary metabolite by synthetic gene cluster. And finally, goes to diethyl glyotoxin, that is a precursor. And then a GLI-T converts to gliotoxin and GLI-A secretes. Or then, oh, there is a lot of gliotoxin, and then has to go back the gliotoxin to diethyl, and the diethyl is converted to GTMA, and GTMA is secreted through a transporter that we don't know yet which one is that. And then you have BMGT, is the uh, B, uh, methylated form of gliotoxin that's not toxic to the fungus, and you have gliotoxin that's toxic to the fungus. That's what you have to keep in mind. You know? That's the hub that's important. You have diethyl digliotoxin can be converted to gliotoxin. Oh, there is a lot of gliotoxin. Then is uh, converted to diethyl again, and GTMA is uh, helping to uh, 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 detoxify by producing a methylated form of gliotoxin. And then it means that GLI-T and GTMA are essential genes in this process. Okay. Uh, most of the producers, they have GLI-T and GTMA. The non-producers, normally, they don't have GTMA. They have only GLI-T, okay? because they are not uh, dealing with uh, a, a biochemical pathway. They just need to get rid of the, the, the GLI-T. We don't know exactly how the non-producers, they detoxify dietyl glytoxin. Probably there are other uh, methyl transferases inside the genome that can, can help to detoxify. That's not very well studied. The non producers. Normally, people they study the producers only. Okay. Again, we have this obsession in my lab for transcription factors. If transcription factors are regulating like T and GTMA expression and resistance, you know. And then we string a library, as I told you, the fumigators has many dedicated libraries like protein kinase, protein phosphatase, uh, uh, transcription factors. Most of the genome now is uh, almost uh, the no, condition, no, no essential genes are deleted now by the group in Manchester. They have a large and generous grant from the Wellcome Trust. And uh, what is uh, really difficult to know is when they are going to distribute all these deletion strains. I hope they do that soon. But the transcription factor library you can buy from one of these health facilities from, from UK. And then we bought it, and then we screen it, and that's the first thing that's amazing. Fumigates dedicates about 3% of the transcription factors to get rid of the toxicity of gliotoxin. No, seems that is really important. And um, there are many transcription factors that are completely unknown. Uh, this one is very well known. It's important for oxidative stress. It's suspected that we have some oxidative stress uh, transcription factor because uh, glycotoxin creates a lot of troubles with oxidative stress. But also we have uh, uh, SCREA that's important for iron, and we know that uh, there is a lot of connection between glycotoxin and zinc and iron. And all the others are almost unknown. We don't know very much about them. Mojar is important for kojic acid production in uh, Aspergillus oryzae, but fumigates does not produce kojic acid. And uh, I'm going to show you this RGLT. RGLT is really interesting. Um, first of all, we looked for the gliotoxin production and BGMT production, all these mutants. Uh, some mutants, they have more production or less production of the gliotoxin or BMGT. But uh, RGLT, that's what I'm going to show to you, it produces less gliotoxin and it produces about the same amount of BMGT than uh, uh, the wild type. 
we deleted the gene, we complemented it, and uh, the RGLT, I can just spoil the, the end of the story, RGLT stands for regulator of GLI-T. Remember that I told you that uh, the GLI-Z does not regulate regulates the, the, uh, uh, the, the GLI-T gene. It, reg it regulates all the genes in the cluster except GLI-T. And then we deleted the gene, and uh, it's very sensitive to many oxidative conditions and also to gliotoxin. Uh, and then, in order to know the targets, we decided to run RNA-seq, comparing the mutant with the white type. And as you can see here, most of the genes in the cluster, they are regulated by GLI-T, GLI by RGLT, except GLI-I and GLI-J. There are other transcription factors that regulate these two genes. And uh, this is indirect regulation. We don't know if the transcription factor is directly regulating the promoter. And then we decided to take advantage of a technique called chip seek, where we just make a fusion of the protein with a tag like GFP or uh, HA, and then we immune precipitate the protein in the presence of DNA, and then we check if the transcription factor is directly binding to the promoter regions. As you can see here, it binds directly to many of the genes. GLI-Z has a strong binding and GLI-T2 and also binds directly <coughs> to GTMA. I'm going to jump that. I think that's the most important thing is that, um, of course, this was validated. We validated the binding sites. And uh, here you see that when we run uh, our TQPCR experiment, we have the GLI-T. Uh, we are measuring here GLI-T in the background of GLI-Z. As I told you, the GLI-T expression is not dependent on GLI-Z. And then we measure GLI-T expression in the presence of uh, um, RGLT is completely dependent, and also GLI-Z is completely dependent on RGLT. It seems that the model is like that. Um, RGLT is a master regulator that controls GLI-Z directly. GLI-Z controls the expression of all the genes except GLI-T, but also RGLT can control the expression of GLI genes and also GLI-T. And interestingly, uh, it's completely virulent. When we delete our GLT, it's completely virulent in both chemotherapeutic and immunocompetent models. Remember that I told you that gliotoxin, mutants in the gliotoxin pathway, they are only are virulent in the non-neutropenic models. They need the neutrophils. But this guy, this mutant, you know, is a virulent in the chemotherapeutic model, the neutropenic model. It does not need the neutrophils to be a virulent. You know, it means that it's doing something else in, in vivo than only controlling the production of gliotoxin and also the susceptibility, the, uh, uh, the resistance to gliotoxin. We are investigating that in vivo now. We don't know exactly what is doing in vivo. I think I, I have already talked a lot, you know, and, and, and I just uh, I hope I convinced you that secondary metabolites in, in fungi, they are really interesting and they are really important for mediated interaction, not only with the host, but also with uh, uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa. But of course, lots of people have been participating. I'm lucky because I have a lot of very good postdocs in my lab. I have been interacting with a lot of colleagues that are really fantastic in terms of the secondary metabolite production. I'm not a chemist. I cannot do it. I'm a geneticist. I have colleagues that uh, help us with the bioinformatics, with uh, the ship seek. And, uh, uh, and we have uh, nice and decent funding uh, from Brazil. FAPESP is amazing agents in Sao Paulo State. And our national council, we, have, we are subrecipients of a, a grant of NIH that is coordinated by Antonis Rocas in Vanderbilt. And uh, we have some money from Portugal. I'm a visiting professor in the Nova from Lisbon. I think uh, people are open for questions if you have time.
Thank you. Thank you so much, Gustavo, for giving a one, another wonderful one hour lecture after your keynote lecture yesterday at the Transmedics Mycology Conference in Athens, which also was co covering a completely different topic. That really shows you're doing a lot of research in different areas. Um, other questions in the audience or in the online chat? Not yet. I thought so. Robert. Yeah, so the question was about usage of macrolides that we use, of course, um, for um, treatment of pseudomonas, um, for, you know, additional treatment, and whether this effect may also have an effect um, on aspergillus on the macrolides directly, and then via the, the aspergillus pathway may impact um, pseudomonas growth. When you're talking about macrolides, you're talking about the macrolides that are applied or produced by... Oh, okay. Oh, that's a, that's a, that's a... That's an interesting experiment to do. <laughs> I don't, I, we have been thinking about that, you know, about using uh, some drugs to control the growth either of pseudomonas or fumigates and using also uh, tissues or like, uh, you know, uh, uh, pulmonary tissues or macrophage or things like that. But uh, you see, I, I still don't, uh, that's, that's very difficult research, at least for me, you know, I, I, I I don't have a very strong background in bacteriology, you know, but I think uh, uh, it's very complicated, this interaction. I think uh, it's very much dependent on the whole situation, you know. Uh, there are some reports about uh, uh, young cystic fibrosis patients and, and old cystic fibrosis patients, you know, like uh, talking about children, adults, you know. And uh, the interactions are completely different in children, are completely different in adults. And I think, I think it's... Uh, I still don't 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 know exactly. I don't have a very solid idea about uh, which kind of interaction is going on. Uh, my feeling is that uh, both organisms are like uh, couples. Some couples they love each other, but they like to fight, you know. And some couples they fight all the time, and they they don't like each other anymore, they don't know why they are together, and things like that. I think it depends very much on the, the environment, and sometimes they just say, okay, let's do it together, or sometimes they say, no, uh, that's mine, that's not yours. Uh, that's, I think, that's the, the, my view about the, 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 I think there is not a single solution. Probably when you apply amphotericin, uh, you are going to create uh, troubles to the host, too, because you are going to increase by coron sensing the population of pseudomonas, you know. And some people, they believe that uh, sometimes inflammation is decreased because the, the bacteria can, con can control the fungus, you know. And some people, they believe that the uh, inflammation is decreased because the fungus can control the bacteria, you know. <laughs> it's difficult to know. But uh, we, are, I, I, we are trying to understand it at uh, in vitro level. I don't like that, but we are probably going to move to a, a ternary system that is much more complicated. Thank you so much. So I think another question that um, comes to my mind, all, all, always been learning, we are learning so much about metabolites, right? And it's really an emerging field, I think. And, um, you know, we are also much more able to test for them. And what always comes to my mind is always, of course, you know, how much will we be able to use these metabolites um, for treatment of fungal infections, targeting them, you know, additional treatment? Can they be add-on treatments? What are your thoughts on that in the development? Yeah. Uh, for example, um, I didn't have time to show. I have shown you a lot of, a lot of things. But to, one of the things that I didn't show to you is that uh, uh, we are working with needles, especially with needles, you know. And then, uh, actually, we have exactly that in mind, you know. We are comparing things, needles with fumigators, you know. And then one of the first things that we did was 
a transcriptional profiling study, and we took the RGLT. RGLT in needles is exactly the same thing, controls the expression of uh, GLI-T in needles, and needles does not produce it. And then when we compare both of them, uh, the transcriptional profiling in the presence of gliotoxin, we discover lots of genes that are transcriptionally regulated in both systems, you know. And one of these genes was uh, an additional methyltransferase. And remember that I told you GTMA is a methyltransferase. But then we discovered a, an additional one. And then the first thing that we did was to take inhibitors of methyltransferase together with gliotoxin. And then we synergize and the fungus is inhibited. I think I think if we we can think about strategies like that to use like for instance um, uh, we don't need to add the glyotoxin because the fungus is already producing the glyotoxin but maybe you know voriconazole azoles with uh, inhibitors of methyltransferase maybe we, of course we have to look for methyltransferase inhibitors that are more specific for the fungus in our case we took a global methyltransferase inhibitors, no? But that could be one way of doing it, you know? Uh, try to look for the way the fungus is trying to protect against the, the toxin. And that's not only probably applicable to gliotoxin, probably to many other secondary metabolites. We are, we are investigating gliotoxin, but we have been considering the possibility of investigating other secondary metabolites. Because uh, as I showed to you, uh, deleting the gliotoxin is not enough to kill, to, to dis disrupt the interaction of pseudomonas. Sometimes you need, you, but pyrupyrupeno is, what pyrupyrupeno is there, we have no clue, you know. It's complicated, yeah. difficult. Makes sense, but I think it's very intriguing to kind of like rob the organism from his, his protective mechanism, yeah. you know, by giving one of the metabolites and thereby, you know, have yeah. the organism basically produce a toxin that kills the organism itself. Um, so I think, yeah, that's, I think, intriguing approaches and maybe a chunk treatment approaches also in the future. Um, so great. Are there any other questions? Carl? You see, we have been doing that for many decades, all right, Lovasta chain and uh, many other secondary metabolites are used for treating many human disorders. I think it's possible. Uh, the point is uh, how you are going to reduce the toxicity against the host, you know, that, that's always the question, you know, that's always the, the trouble, uh, how you can prepare analogs and, but I, I think, I think we have a lot of resources, you know, what we don't have now is uh, companies and uh, people who want to put money on that. Because if you talk, if you, you talk about reducing blood pressure, you know, you talk about, uh, you know, getting, not getting fat, ah, you have a lot of money available, you know, but uh, against the uh, fungal disease, that's a, that's a, the main trouble. Because all the technology is there, you know. So I think what what is summarizing is you know for diagnostics of course they could could be meaningful but we would need assays right to practically test for that in a rapid way a rapid turnaround time for specific metabolites. One well, thing I can add too is that um, uh, for example why not to design like you said a diagnostic for gliotoxin? Uh, for example, we have been doing lots of things in the lab following GLI-T and GTMA inside the cell. It's very complicated, it's very interesting. And uh, we don't have antibodies against it. Now we are trying to do antibodies by using phage display. Phage display technology is a very strong technology to produce antibodies, you know. Maybe it can be used for diagnosis. Very, but then again, uh, all the resources are there. Uh, we have all the technology, but we don't have the money, you know. We don't have companies investing on that. Uh, 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 Martin mentioned that I, I gave a talk yesterday, and it was about uh, a, a drug, a, a, a compound that can potentiate caspofungin, and that's a beautiful thing. You contact a, a, a pharmaceutical company, and the guy told me that uh, we did more animal experiments, and, and I told him, that's exactly why I'm looking for you, you know, what do you expect that I, I, I pay for? The state pays for all this. <laughs> you have to pay something for this. But anyway, that's the main problem right now.
Thanks so much. And that's also, I think, a very interesting one, one of the other interesting projects, you know, that overcoming resistance, basically, some of these treatments that you're exploring. But yeah, of course, developing drugs is very expensive and it only gets more expensive along the way, even when leaving the animals, of course. Mr. Robert. Can I have another question? Of course. I know in the back it's a coexistence of pseudomonas and candidates. competition between correlation based on Pseudomonas and Candida albicans has been very well studied. There is a lady that I cannot remember the name now from Dartmouth. She has been publishing a lot of, I uh, cannot remember, his, you know who I'm talking about. I cannot remember. There are a lot of data published about that. And, uh, uh, and uh, if you look, Farnesol, all the alcohols, alcohols from, you know, uh, that are important for coron sensing in Canada. They are mediating these interactions. She knows that it's going through cyclic MEP, and she knows a lot of things already, you know. I think uh, some of these pathways maybe are conserved, you know. Uh, that's my feeling because I have this G-alpha proteins, maybe it's, they are activating. We are doing this experience in the lab now, checking for MPK phosphorylation, protein kinase A. Uh, in Canada, the interaction between uh, uh, kind of all because in, and uh, Sodomon is mediated through Farnesol and uh, Cyclame P and protein kinase A. It's very well known, you know, very well studied that. And also, uh, more recently, there are very, very elegant studies from Janet Quinn from, um, I don't remember, somewhere in UK. And she has been showing the importance of secretions. It's not, it's not Pseudomonas. I think it's Staphylococcus, another bacteria. Uh, they actually, we got inspired by the experiments. We are checking now the secretion systems. There are six secretion systems in, in Pseudomonas. We are checking, but it's very beautiful, her work, because she shows that uh, in these bacteria, the secretion systems, they can inject antimicrobial peptides inside candida, you know? Uh, it seems to be antimicrobial peptides, although she doesn't like the idea. It seems to be antimicrobial peptides, and then it's killing the 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 the, the fungus. I think there are a lot of uh, int <coughs> sorry, uh, a lot of interesting things going on in these systems. Yeah. Thank you. So you mean Debbie Hogan, Deborah Hogan? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Deb Hogan. Yeah. When you interact with young people, they can remember. Things. You know, I have a phone. I have a phone while you are talking. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. but yeah, sometimes you remember names. Yeah, I knew it was Debbie. So, <laughs> perfect. Any other question? If not. Uh, Jürgen is taking care of it. Perfect. Okay. Thank you very much, then, everyone, for joining this afternoon, and thank you, Gustavo, of course, for you know visiting and giving this great lecture. Thank you. Thank you very much.